Hey everybody, welcome back to GR Research where today we've got another episode of Dissecting Speakers. And I know you guys have been watching me doing this quite a bit and I've had a few people ask me, do you ever find one that you like? Because <laughs> we've been digging through a lot of these production speakers that are, well, let's just say built to price points. And we find often a lot of cheesy innards in these things. Um, but I have had to answer yes, yes, I do often find some real gems out there. And today might be one of those days. Um, we're looking at three different speakers that have come in and they're really, really different. I'm going to call this one the tale of three crossovers. Because when you get right down to it, it's the crossover design that really makes or breaks a speaker. You can have the best drivers in the world and just put cheesy junk on it and it'll still sound like cheesy junk, even if you do a nice job in the design work. Of course, a lot of times we see really poor design work done and a bunch of cheesy parts on that stuff. And that's just what you see often in those price points because there's just no money left there for um, good engineering or well I shouldn't say money left for good engineering there's no money left there for good quality parts we do see some good engineering some of the ELAC stuff is engineered really well I've seen some of the Polk stuff come through here that's designed really well but they're just built to price points and sometimes you find some gems out there and today might be one of those let's look at what's come in First of all, this uh, pair of speakers that's sitting here on my left, I've got one of them uh, partially taken apart. This is a new EPOS, I shouldn't say new, it's an EPOS ES12 model. It's very unique in the way it's designed. Here we have an ATC monitor that uh, is often used for studio monitoring. And then over here, a very popular BMW 602 model. I think it's a 602. Uh, S2 model and they're all designed very differently and the crossover work is very different between all of these so let's let's go through these and make some comparisons and I want to start with this EPOS model this is very uniquely designed what they've done on this little woofer here is they're playing this thing wide open no crossover and then on the tweeter there's just a single capacitor and I've taken the, the panels apart here where you can see inside this one poly cap is all there is to the whole crossover. And I know there's a lot of people out there that say that's got to be the best. The best crossover is no crossover. The best crossover is, you know, the least amount in the signal path. And it's true even when I do design work, I try to design to where I'm putting the least amount of parts in the crossover as I possibly can. No more than are necessary. And you have to make some trade-offs when you're doing the design work. But it's really rare that you can make a single cap on a tweeter blend well with a woofer and work. It's just a lot of trade-offs there. Uh, if we look at the frequency response on this thing, you'll see a little bit of a humped area right around 7 or 800 hertz and it just drops off right below that. That's where we have what's called a baffle step loss. That's when the output of the drivers become omni and it starts wrapping around the cabinet and it loses output. So from about 700 hertz on down, it's losing output. So you got a little drop off there in output. So you're left with kind of a little peak there. If we look further up in the response, the, the woofer has a pretty good little peak in its response at about, well, right at 4,000 hertz, just before 4,000 hertz. There's a, a little peak there. Um, common with a lot of woofers uh, before you know, um, you know when they reach the top of their range sometimes you have a little bit of break up there a little uh, a, a little amplitude rise and it's the case with this little driver as well it's not bad for a driver with no network on it it's not bad but if you look there's that little peak and if you look at the spectral decay in the spectral decay you see a little trailing resonance there doing the same thing you know it's um, it's a little stored energy there so there's a little bit of breakup and there's nothing there to control it so you're gonna hear that a little bit so there's pros and cons to trying to do something like this and it's almost impossible to make it work 
Um, I would have to say they made it work reasonably well. I mean, it's a choppy response, but it maintains a pretty good average. It's within plus or minus two and a half dB, almost plus or minus two dB over most of the range. So it's good if you're right on tweeter axis. Now let me explain. If you'll notice in the crossover again, uh, the crossover point is right at 6,000 hertz. Uh, at 6,000 hertz, the wavelengths are about two inches long. So imagine um, at this crossover point between the tweeter and the woofer, we've got the microphone out here right in line with the tweeter. As you move up or down, you're changing the time arrival between the woofer and between the tweeter. If you move up, you're getting closer to the tweeter and you're getting further away from the woofer. If you move down, of course, you're getting closer to the woofer and further away from the tweeter. So you're changing the time arrival of one versus the other. When the crossover point is at 6,000 hertz and they're only like two inches long, it doesn't take much of a movement for there to be enough time delay for the wavelengths from one to be delayed in such a way that they're out of phase from the wavelengths leaving the other driver. So what you get is if you move up or down, you get cancellation in the response. So let's look at that. Let's look at the the vertical off axis measurement. That means we're on axis and we start going up four inches at a time at one meter away. That's how we're taking these measurements. And as you can see, the frequency response starts dropping out pretty quickly. And at uh, 12 inches up, it's, it's, there's a huge hole in the response. So if you're listening to these and you stand up and you realize, hey, some of the top end just dropped out of it, it did, it dropped out of it. And if you do the opposite, you go down in frequency in measuring height, as we did. If we look at the vertical off axis going down, um, just four inches down to almost woofer axis, maybe not even two woofer axis, just a little above woofer axis, and there's a huge hole in the response. And then four more inches down, so eight inches down, and then there's a there's a huge hole that just completely sucks off of the graph almost. It's completely gone. It's the, the yellow line that you see. And then as you go four inches further down again, now we're going back up in time. In other words, the wavelength is already passed. You're catching the next wavelength up and it's starting to become back in phase even though it's a wavelength behind. And you see the green line, it's come back up a little bit, but it's still a mess in the vertical off axis. Now I know a lot of people will say, well, I just listened to it on axis anyway. Well, no, you don't. Uh, if you're outdoors or you're in an anechoic chamber, then you're just listening to it on axis. But if you're listening to it in your room, what you're hearing is what we call a room response or a power response. That means it's a combination of the on axis and the horizontal reflections in the room and the vertical reflections. And usually the biggest reflection point in the room is the ceiling. So you're hearing that reflection and all the other reflections and you're taking all that in and you're, you're, you're hearing a summation or a average of that, if you will, if you were looking at it from a microphone standpoint, but you're also hearing it in a time sensitive way to where you're hearing it delayed reflections and that's creating some of that ambience and size of the room that you hear. And when there's a huge hole in the response somewhere, well, you're hearing a re reflection, for instance, off the ceiling in the lower frequency range and in the high frequency range, but where they're crossing, you don't hear a reflection. So you're hearing just bits and pieces that are reflected instead of that reflection be, being a more direct reflection of the on-axis response. So the room response is going to be a little rougher. Um, horizontal off-axis was not bad. If, if we stay on tweeter axis and start moving across, it looked okay. Um, but overall, there's a trade-off in going to this type of design. Um, it's inexpensive, and the way they've made the, the whole speaker is inexpensive. This whole back panel is plastic. It's a form plastic, the same way for the whole front baffle. And there's some long screws that go from one baffle to the other that hold it together. And there's some gasket material there that squeezes down on uh, to seal it. So a really easy way to, to make this. It's not really a cheap plastic. I mean, think of it as a hard polymer. So it's a pretty heavy plastic. I don't think you're gonna have resonance issues with that. You may have a little bit with the box. Um, there's one brace running through it. It's really running through it in the wrong direction. Um, 
it really needs to be running the opposite direction because it's putting surface area uh, that, that the output from that woofer is going to reflect off of. And there is going to be output from the woofer that's in the box in this model because the woofer plays up so high. Think of it as the woofer's playing up so high, those shorter wavelengths are propagating within the box. And the box is having to deal with that. And there's only a little piece of stuffing and it's in the very back from the brace forward, there's nothing there. So there's definitely some reflection there that's going to reflect back through. And we're seeing a little bit of it possibly in the spectral decay that may be part of that break up there. And down low, you notice the output drops and then it comes back up. And then there's more stored energy there right at the very bottom. So a lot of that could be the reflections within the box. Whereas some of these other speakers that have a lower crossover point, those wavelengths that the woofer is playing are quite longer. It's not really playing those shorter wavelengths. The longer wavelengths really won't propagate in the box very well. If the wavelength that it's playing at the highest frequency is six inches long, that six inch long wavelength is barely even propagating in here. It has to, it has to create one waveform for you to actually hear that sound. Otherwise it's more of just pressure in the box. So you have to take into account what the woofer's doing in order to control it. So something that's designed like this would need more insulation and more damping all around it to control those higher frequencies that are propagating within the box. And this one didn't have it. So um, it's not a design I would go with if I were a designer. If I were saying the end all be all design is gonna be a single cap, it is not. Because there are a lot of compromises and you're giving up a lot to go to less and it doesn't work out for many designs. Another thing I want to mention is um, the connections on this is very similar to a tube connect connector. It's a very small uh, either brass um, connector. There's no nuts on the back. There's nothing ferromagnetic. Um, it only takes a banana plug though. So you're doing away with a whole binding post which is good. I give them kudos for that. That's awesome. That helps the sound quality to get all that out of the signal path, but you're still having to put a banana plug in there, so you're still passing the signal all the way through a banana plug versus a tube connector where it's hollow all the way to the tip and your wire's all the way to the tip and you basically just have a coating around the wire. Um, but, like I said, better than just a big binding post. So, interesting little design. Um, I'm going to see what I can do with this thing. I may go in and do what's called a Zobel network, which is really just an impedance trap at the end of the woofer's response, and see if I can get a little of that peakiness at the top of the woofer's range, see if I can get that out of it without putting an inductor or more parts in the signal path, and see if it'll clean up the impedance. I know the impedance it looked like it has a little hump in it, right around 600 hertz or so, there's a little impedance resonance, and that may be causing a little bit of problem as well. We'll see what I can do with that. We'll see if I can do a little impedance trap. We'll see if we can pull that top end off of the woofer just a little bit, and then maybe we can move that crossover point a little further down, letting the tweeter play down a little bit lower. And we'll see what I can do there. I might even do a little um, notch filter right where the peak is to pull that risen area right there where it's lost its baffle step loss. Maybe I can do a little something there and pull that down. We'll, We'll see what I can do with that. Next up, I really want to go right to the B&W speaker. Uh, the B&W speaker, um, let's talk about the box first. It's about a five inch thick box that is particle board. And I'm not talking the really good particle board that's heavy. This is the one full of voids. Let me just move this little box over here so we can look at this one. Um, if you look at the back of it, you can see the edges of the particle board there. It's very lightly made. I don't know that there's any bracing in this thing. And there's the crossover. Looking at the frequency response, um, as you can see, the tweeter level is a little higher than the woofer level. And that's common with the BMW speakers. They're known for being a little hot in the top end. They are. They got a little zing to them. No doubt. If you look at the crossover response, you'll see it crosses at about 3200 and 
they're not summing at the crossover point, which means the drivers are not in phase. They're only gaining about a dB, so um, they're probably about 70 or 80 degrees out of phase. So if they were 90 degrees out of phase, you'd get no gain or no loss from them. You just, the response would just follow the curvature of the drivers themselves. We're gaining a little, but not much. And then up in the up in the range the tweeter's covering, the woofers come out of phase with the tweeter's response and it's knocking a little output out of it up at the top where it's completely out of phase. So, doesn't look that great. Um, the woofer's response looks pretty smooth, but it's, it's really crossing too high. If we look at the horizontal off-axis response, it doesn't look too bad. There's a little bit of a humped area up in one spot, but it doesn't look too bad. If you look in the vertical off axis, that means we are measuring at the tweeter axis and then we're starting to raise the microphone up four inches at a time at one meter. You'll see a dropout right at the crossover region where the drivers are starting to become out of phase. They weren't in phase very much to begin with and as you go up vertically, it gets worse and there's a whole response there. Uh, the impedance curve is okay. Um, nothing hard to drive there. And if we look at the spectral decay, we'll see some stored energy there. Um, right at the top of the woofer's range or at the bottom of the tweeter's range is a little bit of ring there, but not, not too bad. Overall, okay. But then we got this. This is the crossover. And at least the inductors are air core. They didn't put an iron core through it. Now granted, the, the inductor on the woofer is about 18 gauge, maybe 19 gauge. I, I bet it's 19 gauge. And the little inductor here on the tweeter is probably 21 gauge or smaller. It's tiny. It's the dental floss variety. It's got a couple of caps on there, these little square stack caps. These are really cheesy. And it's got one sandcast resistor on there that's, I think, a 5 watt resistor. It's this is the cheap stuff. This is the mass produced stuff that doesn't cost much to throw in and make it work crossover. Um, what I'll probably do with this is go in and try and redesign a real crossover for it. Maybe I can pull the crossover response down a little bit, get the drivers in phase, fill that hole, bring the tweeter level down, balance it out a little bit. I bet there's a lot that can be done with this. It needs some no res put in the box to control some of the resonances. It's it needs help. Uh, not too many kudos for these guys. Now let's look at the last one, and I saved it for last for a reason. I have a little bit of mixed feelings about this little speaker. It's the ATC speaker. The cabinet's only five eighths of an inch thick, and it came stuffed with this stuff, um, which is a little bit of a loose stuffing that's just kind of thrown in. There's no bracing. Well, I'll take the back. There's the one brace. Um, but it's still pretty thin, needs a little help there. It's veneered really well, so that part looks nice. Um, but that's about all you can really say for the cabinet. Mm, no home runs there. Let me grab this stuff. Ah, oh, yeah, my measurements are all falling down on me. But then there's these drivers. Their drivers are made pretty nicely. This woofer has a huge voice coil on it, and which means a lot of moving mass. The cone material is fairly thick. It is a paper cone, probably has a good sound, but there's a lot of moving mass here. A lot of moving mass means they gotta put a lot of motor structure on it to control it, and it's got it. It's got a lot of motor structure. It's got a heavy cast frame to support it. Um, that's a pretty beefy driver. Probably one of the beefiest drivers I've ever seen in a two-way speaker. And the dome tweeter looks real nicely made. I mean, this is a well-made fabric dome tweeter. So, nice drivers. Probably as nice as any in the business. Now, I don't know how clean this is going to sound as it approaches the tweeter's range because there's a lot of moving mass there. So, there may be some trade-offs in the clarity in that, in that area, but overall, that's a pretty nicely made driver. And then let's look at the crossover on this. Compared to a lot of the stuff we've been looking at, the crossover on this is not bad. This is similar to what we sell in our budget level kits. We've got all air core inductors. 
Um, the caps are all poly caps. Um, they're a private labeled cap. It has ATC on the caps. They're probably made by Benic. They look like Benic caps. But the resistors are all the Sandcast resistors. So inexpensive resistors, inexpensive caps, but they are poly caps and pretty good quality air core inductors. I say good quality. There's this is 16 gauge on the tweeter and this is 14 gauge on the woofer. So pretty nice, pretty nice crossover compared to everything else I've seen in here lately. This has probably been the nicest crossover. Um, the wiring is inexpensive, just PVC wiring. There is some push on connectors on the tweeter. Um, there are some unusual little banana plugs for the woofer itself that plugs into it. Uh, the binding posts on it are a little bit cheesy. Um, they do have the steel screws at the back of them, which is pretty much like everything on the back of the B&W stuff. And this particular pair, the customer, one of the customers has replaced one of the sets of binding posts with what looks like some Cardis binding posts. So all, all uh, brass nuts on it and either brass or copper uh, binding posts. And I'm sure that improved the clarity quite a bit. It's not as good as say a tube connector, but that's a good step in the right direction. So what would I do with these? Um, well, let's look at how they measured. Look at the frequency response. You'll see overall it's really smooth. Um, the tweeter level is down. It's down and output. It needs to come up a good dB or so. Um, so if you're using these for mixing, uh, when you're through mixing it and you play it back on some other speakers, you might think your mix is a little hotter than you wanted it to be because the top end was down on the monitors that you were using for mixing. Um, if you're wanting your, your mixes to come out a little brighter and a little sharper, a little, a little more aggressive on the top end, this might be a good speaker for you to mix with because it may fool you into thinking that it's one way when it's really another. Now, I tend to lean towards having it linear all the way across. I, I want to would think I would want to hear what I'm mixing and hear it exactly as it is rather than using a speaker that's artificially um, EQ'd or I would say in such a way that it causes you to mix it in a different way. Um, but overall the frequency response is really smooth. Um, if we look at the horizontal off axis, drops off in the horizontal plane really smooth all the way across. Don't see any issues there. If you look at the vertical off axis it looks like they're probably crossing at about 2800 or 3k but they're in phase over that range as you start to move up it's staying in phase pretty well just barely drops out a little bit at 12 inches up so the time domain between these drivers is really good Peden's curves looks pretty smooth I don't see any issues there obviously this is a sealed box versus the other drivers here or the other speakers that are ported so this might be better sitting over a console or with a, you know with windows or a wall behind it because it's sealed if you look at the spectral decay you'll see that it is very clean much cleaner than either of these two um, in fact i don't see really any issues with the spectral decay uh, the only issue at all i see with it is that the tweeter level is voiced down a little bit on the top end and so what would I do with this thing? I would probably just leave this as it is. I wouldn't try to um, completely redesign anything. There's no reason to redesign the crossover. They did a good job engineering everything. The frequency response looks good other than the tweeter being down. So what I would do is just go in and replace the poly caps that are on the board, maybe with some sonic caps and replace these resistors with some Mills resistors. And I would manipulate the value of the resistors just slightly and bring that tweeter level up about a dB, maybe half a dB and balance it out a little bit better. The sonic caps and the uh, Mills resistors will improve clarity quite a bit and rewiring it with some better wire is going to help some and replacing a set of the binding posts with some tube connectors. That's going to help and lining the cabinet with no res is going to also help quite a bit because it's pretty thinly made. So not much money would have to be spent on these to really take them to another level in clarity and the resonance issues of the box, we can, we can take care of that. Um, I haven't worked up a total on it yet, but not much money to take it from already a really good level to pretty high level. Um, I'm sure with 
with those tweaks, this is probably a really good sounding speaker. Even the way it came, it's by far, compared to a lot of the other mini monitors that have been in here, probably the best that I've seen. So I definitely have to give a thumbs up to ATC with really good engineering, with really good quality drivers, and pretty good quality crossover. Um, so they're not always bad. Sometimes they're really good. So I hope you guys enjoyed this diving into this three completely different type of speakers. And that's it for this week. Next week, who knows, we may be digging into some more speakers or doing something totally different. I appreciate all you guys watching. Hit the subscribe button, please. And we'll see you guys next week.